Hey. What's going on, everybody? Um, what was that? It's good to be here uh, all the way across the sea. So first of all, I want to thank the Vidlife Go Society of London for having me as a patron. I've been talking about this disease, this disorder, whatever you want to call it, for uh, well over a decade now. And when I first started to speak about it, there wasn't many people out there kind of showing their face and talking about it. And I got so much attention, I was literally overwhelmed. But now, as I travel around, it's more than heartwarming to see the amount of faces, uh, and I say faces with vitiligo because they're magical to me. I've never um, struggled so hard with something in life, finding my way to positivity. And that's what I'm going to talk about today, is the uniqueness of having this disease. Because uh, in this day and age, honestly, we're all looking for that one thing that gets us more likes, online and off of line. We all want the likes, we want the views, we want the love. And this disease makes you immediately unbelievably unique. So uh, I'm going to switch to my, my, um, my program here. Double click. Da 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 Music while you wait. Click. Da da de de. All right. Okay, before I start, I wouldn't be a good guy, a good TV guy, if I didn't bring a little TV with me. So I never assume that everybody knows who I am or what I do. Here, you call it a TV presenter. In uh, Michigan, where I'm from, it's a uh, anchor reporter, and I've been covering entertainment since 1991. Uh, so I've interviewed almost every movie star or television star or musician, and I've had uh, vitiligo uh, for a very long time as well. And it's an interesting duality to be in a place that is so unbelievably vain, like Hollywood, and deal with that all the time, and still have this disease that most people think a TV presenter could not live through. So the story today is not only about how I found my way through this disease and remained myself, because a disease can change who you think you are. I mean, we all have those things that make us different. We all have those things that we think we can't tell other people about. But today, hopefully my story will be an example of how you can not only have this and live through it, that it actually may be one of the best things that's ever happened to you. So we'll talk about that a lot more on the other side of this, but for those people who haven't seen me on TV, and that's probably everybody here in this country, <laughs> take a look. Yep, my name's Lee Thomas, and I'm an anchor and entertainment reporter for WJBK Fox 2 in Detroit. I've been on the job for well over a decade, and I am best known for my fun celebrity interviews. I'm telling you how much a fan I am, Q. Yeah, yeah. Just waking up in the morning, gotta thank, thank God. God. <laughs> I don't know, but today <laughs> seemed kinda odd. What, what is that? What got you in that mode? I think, like you say, having that um, sort of positive attitude. Life is like okay. a box of chocolates. You never know what you're gonna get. At. Au revoir, la ville de Detroit. Je ne sais pas le mot en français, mais uh, c'était bien parler avec vous. Uh, bon après-midi. Au revoir. Okay. Ciao. <laughs> to both of you, thank you very much. And to Bradley, my co anchor now thank needs you. oxygen. So I'm sitting across from Charlize, freaked out because she just said, she, You read my book? Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. yeah and I was incredibly heart. moved by it, and I was telling you, Thank you for writing it. And little did I know, my biggest imperfection would become my biggest story. This is my face without makeup. I have a disease called vitiligo, and over the years, my pigment has been slowly leaving and leaving until at one point, it was all the way gone. 2005 was the first time I shared my story on TV and revealed my face without makeup for the first time. It was a tough decision, and the story made national news. Two years after that, Turning White, the memoir I had written, was released, and that made international news. I started a support group 
and went on several TV and radio shows all over the world. But that started something that continues today. It seems like I spend a lot of time in airports. I have become an advocate for vitiligo patients and a motivational speaker sharing my story around the world. But it is a tough struggle as I continue to fight for people around the world who use my story as inspiration or people who live with this disease so that they don't have to face the ignorance and intolerance like this phone call I got last week. You're not gonna like what I got to say, but I'm gonna say it. You need to go back to your natural look. You look like a freak. It's unreal. And uh, it's not natural. Have a nice life, but God, you're freaky. You just plain freaky, you know. You scare people, you know. Woo! Now, I shared a little bit of a three-minute phone message with you, not to spread hate, but to help you understand the point. It's not about how many times someone knocks you down with their words or their actions. It's about how many times you get up and find a way to help your fellow man by living your life, sharing, and helping in a positive way. But this journey has turned into so much more than a guy with the disease. It's a life-changing, heartwarming mission as I show myself unmade, unclothed, and unafraid for the whole world to see. You know, it's never, it's never really been easy to call, to do what I call living out loud. Uh, but as I travel around uh, the world speaking to different groups, I've received so much love and compassion. The first World Vidligo Day was at the U.S. Capitol in Washington, D.C. And as I get ready to do uh, my job every day, I understand that everyone cannot see past this disorder. That some people can't hear what I'm saying when uh, they see the vidligo. And now I'm trying to change minds. And it seems, it seems sometimes like it's difficult to change the way people view things. But I know that it may be uh, a tough journey, and it's not easy at times. But as you work your way through this, what I call, some people may think it's an impossible mission, but others see beauty. They see strength. They see a multitude of different things, and we break down that wall of intolerance and just show people that we have that force within us that unifies us all in love and strength and that we're never truly, truly alone at all. So when I go around the world and talk, it's important to me that people understand that you can live through so much. And is that it? Good? Good. Mm -hmm. uh, I want people to understand that you can not only, uh, not only achieve and adjust, but you can grow from the experience. And that's truly what I believe. I think that I have become the man that I always wanted to be through this disease. I have become that person. It's made me stronger. It's given me more understanding. It's taken me to places I never, I never thought I would go uh, inside and out. Now, it's not easy. And let's go back to the tough part. Because in the beginning, when I first got vitiligo, I turned into what I called the angry spotted guy. And people would look at me, and they would, um, they would either look at me with fear, or they'd look at me with some kind of face that I did not understand. And so my reaction to them would be what most people do. You know that, that uh, face you get when you're walking through the city streets, so you're walking through the tube and you don't want people to mess with you, so you have that tough face on so that everybody leaves you alone. So I would do that to people. I'm going to come down here. Ah, can everybody still see me? So I would do that face to people because that's what you do. They look at you and you look back at them with that mean face, like, leave me alone kind of thing. But that was, that was never me. I was always that happy-go-lucky kid that would be dancing in the supermarket with my mom. But because I got this disease, all of a sudden I turned into this face of anger or, 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 or hurt or something that really did not express who I am. So one day 
I just decided that I have to do this differently. Because you look at somebody with fear or even anger, and you know what you get back? Fear and anger. You get it right back. And I said, maybe if I give something else, I may get something else back. So I called this, I'm very simple in my approach to things. I'm not a doctor, I'm not a scientist. So I just called it opposite day, something I used to do when I was a kid. So when people would look at me in a way that I did not understand, I in turn would smile and give them that, you know, megawatt smile that got me that TV job in the first place. <laughs> so the guy looking at me, and I'm in the line at a grocery store, which everybody goes to grocery way too much because I got grocery store stories, but I'm looking, he's staring at me, and I can feel him looking at me. You know, like when somebody's looking at you, I call it a tennis match, where he's looking at you, and then you look at him, and he looks away, and then you look back away, and he looks at you again, then you look at him, he looks away, <laughs> then you look at you, and he looks at you again, you look at him, and he looks away. So we played that visual tennis for a few seconds, and, f and finally, boom, I, ca I caught his eye. And I'm like, hey, how you doing? And I give him the smile. And it was such a shock that I actually spoke. He went like that, like I had knocked him over. He's like, whoa, he speaks. And I'm like, how's it going, dude? He's like, good, good. And then it was that little fearful, are we OK? Is he going to yell at me, kind of? I'm like, no, no. I said, I said, hey, I'm good, I'm good. I said, it's vitiligo. He goes, uh-huh. He goes. The same thing Michael Jackson had. He goes, oh, that's what I thought. Michael Jackson had the same thing, right? I go, yeah, he did. He goes, man, it looks so cool. I'm like, does it? OK, because I wasn't sure the way you were looking. He goes, no, I was just looking at it. See, it's like on your ear, too. And I go, I know. He goes, on your nose, too. I go, I know. I go, yeah, it's just a little bit of everywhere. He goes, man, it's cool. And I go, OK. I ended up talking to the guy for about five minutes. And it, he walked away very different than what I expected was going to happen and very different than what I think he I expected was going to happen. And I knew right then that I could treat this thing differently. But the series of lessons, uh, lessons come in, in bundles to me. Until you learn the lesson, it keeps coming. So uh, it... It didn't turn into, you know, what do you call it, uh, rose-colored glasses. It didn't, everything wasn't great after that. It still was a difficult process. And as I tried to react in positivity, better things started happening. I went to the gas station, and, and when we get gas in the States, there's a, the, the, the meter readout is here, the pump is here, and there's a little space where you can see the other person through, through the thing, even though they're right on the other side getting gas you never talk to them. I mean, they're like six feet away getting gas, and you're over here in your car getting gas, but you never speak to that person. But I was getting gas one day, and I could feel the lady staring at me, and I thought it was going to be a visual tennis match, so I look at her, and she looks right at me. She doesn't stop staring at me, and she looks at me and goes, mm. You know, I call that stink face. I have names for everything. I call that stink face. It's like when people look at you, and they think they smell, it looks like they smell something. So they do their nose like that and they look, give you the like squinty old face. So she gave me stink face, look me right in the eye. And I'm like, hey, how you doing? Stink face, ugh, huh. I'm like, okay. So I get my gas, we meet at the door going into the gas station to, to uh, I was gonna get some chips, I'd already paid at the pump. But she, uh, we meet at the door and she, um, kind of does the same thing. I, I open the door, I hold it for her. She looks at me and goes, mm. And I go, mm. And she, she goes, what's wrong with you? And I go, nothing except the price of gas. What's wrong with you? And hit her with the smile. And she goes, she was shocked that I was still happy. And, said, mm. and I go, mm. And so she turns around and walks in the gas station all angry. And I just started laughing because so many times, you will be faced with absolute negativity. But don't allow it to become what you are. That is the choice. Now, she walked away, walked out of the gas station angry. I walked out of the gas station laughing because every time I went, mm, she got mad. So I went, mm. She's walking out of the gas station like, mm, bye. Mm. 
<laughs> it's just a choice to be positive no matter what someone gives you because you cannot control other people. And 90% of the people will give you something positive. But there's that 10%, that 10% that just doesn't have anything positive to say. You know that everybody knows someone that you walk up to them in the morning and you go, hey, how you doing? And they go, ah, I'm okay. And you're like, are you? Because you don't seem okay. And no matter what you say to them, they're still, ah. So that one ten percent is what you got to have your arsenal ready for. But the biggest change for me happened, the one that truly changed everything, was uh, I met these two little girls, separate times, about two and a half month period apart, these two little girls that I met. They're, they just have an indelible mark on me because what happened with me and them changed my life from that point forward. Now, the first little girl I met, I was getting ready to go to work. Vidligo was getting worse on my face. Um, I had I was trying to figure out how to deal with it, my opposite day, all of these things, remain positive, all this stuff. And so I went to the, the park before work, walked through the park, and there was a, you know how they have those uh, train of kids holding hands, a little three, four year olds, and they walk in the park together and they play around. So I liked watching them before I go to work because kids are funny. They can literally run in a circle and be happy until they get dizzy and fall down and they're happy. And I'm like, that's awesome. So I'm watching the kids play in the park, and um, I was just writing in my journal, trying to get my head space right, and um, I noticed that I was late for work, so I jump up, and I have to walk straight through the park to get, get to my car, to get to, you know, get out of here and get to work. And as I'm walking through, laughing at the kids, one kid, a little girl, runs up, and she runs directly into my leg. And she's playing, didn't see me at all. She runs right into my leg and falls all the way back on the, on the ground. And like just looking straight up at me. So she fell down. I'm like, oh, are, hey, are you all right? And as soon as I look at her, this, this little girl, she, she cries. She, she screams. And so I thought that I had hurt her when she hit my leg and fell. So I reached out to try and pick her up because she was like a two or three year old. And, and she screamed even louder. So at that point, I realized that she was afraid of me. And it was my face that was scaring this little girl. And that was difficult for me to deal with. Because kids don't have any malice in their heart. They're just pure honesty. She wasn't trying to be smart like the woman at the gas station. She wasn't trying to figure anything out like the man at the grocery store. She was really afraid. You know, if you've ever hung out with kids, there's a level of scream. There's the one scream where mom looks over there and says, get up, dust yourself off, and go. There's a level two scream where mom stands up, walks over a little bit to make sure you're not bleeding, and then she goes, you all right? And then you go. Then there's the level three scream where every adult in the room gets up and starts going over to that kid because there's absolutely something wrong. That little girl was, was level three uh, screaming. She was afraid of me. And if I reached out to her again, she yelled louder. So I took a step back, I, I put my hands by my side and I said, somebody come and help this kid. Somebody come help the kid. It's one of the most difficult things I've ever had to go through. And so I went to work that day. I put on my makeup immediately. And I did the whole day of work. And I, I, went, I went straight home. For two months, I didn't go out of the house without my makeup. Before that, I'd go to work, put on my makeup. When I'm done with work, take the makeup off and go live my life. But this day, I said, I, I, I scare small children. How do, you, how do you wrap your mind around that? And so. I would do everything with my makeup on. After work, I'd go to the grocery store, go to the bank, go to anything I needed to do with my makeup on, and then I'd go home and take my makeup off and I'd stay home. And people with 
the deal with vitiligo, we all have done this. We've all locked ourselves away. And so when I did that, I was just at home for two weeks and three months. Uh, sorry, two months and three days. Two months and three days I was at home just watching TV, just trying to figure out how I can go back outside and not scare small children. So I was watching a show called Oprah. I don't know if it was over here. You guys know Oprah over here? Mm -hmm. Well, it's okay, because men watched Oprah when it was on, so I'm still a man, and I watched Oprah. I liked her, okay? So I was watching Oprah one day, and obviously I was single at the time because my basketball and my basketball shoes and my shorts and pretty much everything was on the floor by the TV in the living room, which I've learned is not where you should put your stuff, I hear. So I look at my basketball stuff, and I say, I just, you know what? I just want to go play ball, you know? I just want to play ball. If the dudes that I play ball with don't want to guard me, or some kid comes in the gym and starts screaming because I have a LIGO, I'm just going to have to deal with it. Because I just want to go play ball, man. So I go to the gym that I had always gone to, YMCA, and I played ball with the fellas who saw my face change from what it used to be to what it is. And, and I played, and I saw kids would come in the gym, they'd look at me for a few minutes, and then they'd go away. Everything was cool. Nobody cried. Nobody screamed. So I'm like, cool. My thought is, go to places that they had seen me before where my face changed and they knew me, so then I'd be cool because they already knew the deal. So I'd just go places I'd already been without makeup on. So I started doing that. And two months and two weeks later, I'm in a grocery store. Everything's going well. I'm going to the bank. People know me at the bank. Hey, Lee, nobody's screaming. Nothing's going wrong. About two months and two weeks later, I'm at a grocery store, and I'm trying to get this, these rice cakes. I like the ranch-flavored rice cakes. Don't hate me. I just love them. I can't help it. And they're on the bo on bottom shelf. Uh, I had to get on a knee to get them, and there was no ranch-flavored. So I knew that they, somebody probably hid them behind the nacho flavor because that's what people do so they can come back and buy it again. So I reached behind the nacho flavor to get a ranch, and there was a ranch back there because I put it there last time I was there. And uh, so I'm getting ready to get it, and, and, and as soon as I get ready to stand up, because I'm on one knee getting it from behind the nacho flavor, as soon as I get ready to stand up, I hear a little voice. And she says, you got boo-boo? And I'm like, oh no. It's a little girl, she's about two or three years old. She's standing literally right here, and she is, not screaming, but she's saying something. But as soon as I stand up and she sees my face, she's going to scream. The security from the grocery store is going to come. It's going to be the same thing all over again, and I don't know what I'm going to do. And I'm thinking all this in my head while I'm holding the rice cakes. So I decide I'm just going to stand up and handle it, uh, you know, like a man. So I stand up and I go, hi, my name's Lee. I have vitiligo. About 1 to 2% of the world population has vitiligo. <laughs> it's not life-threatening. It's not contagious. And, and you're two years old. And she's looking at me like, what? <laughs> and I'm like, oh. I said, hi. And she says again, she says, you got a boo-boo? So back then, I didn't speak like kid. And so the mom comes over and she says, leave the man alone, he's trying to shop. And I go, no, no, she's not screaming. I just don't speak two-year-old. I don't know what she's saying. Can you translate for me? And she says, um, she wants to know if you have a boo-boo. And I go, oh, she thinks I'm hurt. And so I kneel back down, back to her level, and I, I look her right in the eye and I said, I said no, sweetie, I don't, I don't have a boo-boo, I'm fine. She goes, you don't have a boo-boo? And I'm like, no, no. And she then, the little girl, she, she reaches out and she like touches my face. And she, um, she tries to rub the chocolate into the vanilla or whatever. And she's just rubbing the, my face and she's staring at it and she's touching my eye and she sticks her finger on my nose and I'm just letting her. It's like, this is great, she's not screaming. And so she does all that and she says, um, Dada hoi? Once again, I had to go to mom for the translation. I said, well, she just said something else. Can you, can you say that to her? She goes, does it hurt? And she goes, she wants to know if it hurts. I'm like, oh, oh, no, sweetie, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt at all. She goes, it doesn't hurt? And I'm like, no. And she goes, 
okay. She turns around and goes and gets, gets a loaf of bread and just starts playing with the loaf of bread. And I'm like, that is awesome. It's, it's over. She didn't scream. She didn't start crying. She, she gave me everything that I actually want, which is, is a, a healing touch, uh, understanding, uh, love, and compassion, all of those things this other little girl had that, this, that just changed. It like rocked my, my vision of what little kids were going to do when they saw me with vitiligo. And I, you know, I went home, and I'm like, that was awesome. And I'm sitting, I'm th sitting there thinking, why did one go so terribly wrong and the other one went so unbelievably well and it's just two little girls? And then it, it hit me. One of the little girls didn't know what it was. She had no idea. So she reacted in fear and not understanding. The other little girl because she thought she knew what it was, because she thought it was simply a boo-boo, she had no fear. All she had was compassion and understanding. The difference between one little girl and the other little girl was understanding. And how do people understand you? It's a, simply by educating them. Simply by educating them so they understand what it is and all of a sudden, you get all of those things that you want. Compassion, understanding, love. It was great. So from that day forward to, to this day, actually, I knew that I had to help people to understand what it was. I wasn't going to just walk up on the street and go, hey, I have, my name's Lee. I've been Lego. How you doing? That wasn't, that wasn't my mission. But I did open myself up more to helping people understand vitiligo. The next thing that happened, also, it's children have changed my life more than anything. And this next person that I spoke to was a 14-year-old boy. So I'm in a good, much better place after the two little girls. And I'm working, and I wear makeup on my face, like you saw, but I never cover my hands. Because people with vitiligo know that these are vitiligo hands. Black guy, white hands, must have vitiligo. And they would call me and reach out to me because uh, they would see me on TV and see my hands. So one day this lady calls and she says, my son, he's 14, he has vitiligo. Do you mind talking to him? Because he, you're a role model for him. And I'm like, I am? She says, yes, you're living, you're doing your job, you have vitiligo, you speak to celebrities, he just thinks you're the best. And I'm like, really? I'm like, yeah, have him give me a call. So the kid calls, and I'm talking to him on the phone for like 40 minutes after a newscast one day. And he, um, he's a real confident guy. Takes karate, he, uh, he's very active in school, A student. He's very confident sounding on the phone. And I'm like, kid, why are you calling me? You, you got it together. And he says to me something that changed my world. The kid said to me, uh, would you show your face on TV without makeup? And I said, you called to ask me that? He said, yeah. I said, why? Why? You know? I'm thinking in my head, why would I show my face on television without, without makeup? It's a distraction. Why would, that's not going to help me at all. I'm thinking this in my head. Because my boss had asked me, why don't you, show, you know, do a story on yourself? And I'm thinking, sh my boss just wants to, here's the, the black anchor turning white. Dun, 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 dun. Watch the story at five. Dun, 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 dun. They get a lot of promotions. They get a lot of attention. And I don't even get a pay raise. I get nothing. So why would I do that? So I tell my boss, when she asked me, I said, you, know, you can't tell your boss no. So I said, let me think about it, which meant no to me. So I told her, let me think about it for two years. Let me think about it. <laughs> But this kid asked me, and it was different. So I said, why do you want me to show my face on television for you? I mean, why is that important? And he said, very simply, if you show people what you look like and you show them all, maybe they'll treat me differently. It was like a bomb went off. This 14-year-old kid is like the man. 
Because we live in a, in a world where you have all these things that you have to do. And we all have something that makes us different. We all have that thing that we can't tell anybody about. Some people see it, some you can't see, but whatever your burden is, you have it and you carry it with you and you think it's that thing that's going to stop you from succeeding, whatever. And so you feel like you have to hide it and you go to work every day with these blinders on because I have to get through my life and my struggle because it's me that has to make this happen and I've got to do it. And when that kid said that to me, I realized that I was living with those blinders on. I was really only thinking about myself. I really was. And when he said that, if I show people what I look like so they'll treat him differently, boom, blinders off. Five seconds later, absolutely, I'll do a story on it. And I told him he'd have to wait till November to see the story on TV because my boss wants to do it in a ratings book and we, where we get more ratings and she can get more attention, but I'll absolutely, absolutely do that. You can just leave it blue if you yeah, want. Cool. Yeah, you can leave it. Yeah, it's fine. Um, but, but yeah, you, you have to, I, I did that. I said, you know, I would. And then I told this story in 2005 and we got a boatload of emails and letters for all the young people, letters are when you write on a piece of paper, put it in an envelope, and send it through the mail. You guys have that? Do you still do that here? Nobody does that, do they? Anyway, something we used to do back when we rode around in carriages. Um, but I got a lot of mail, like snail mail, and I was overwhelmed. Thousands of letters from a report, from all over the country, from a report that I did in Detroit. Come to find out, they put this story on the news feed, and the story ran all over the country because no one had ever shown their face on television with vitiligo before all the way back in 2005. Didn't know that. I thought everybody knew Michael Jackson had vitiligo, but they didn't. So I'm getting all this mail. I'm getting all this attention. And here's the crazy part. After that kid asked me to do that, I said, sure, I'll absolutely do that. And he said, that's awesome because, well, there's this eight-year-old kid who lives in my neighborhood, and he's dark-skinned like we are, and he has vitiligo. And all the kids tease this guy. And so he wears a mask, like a winter mask, all year round to go outside because people tease him so bad. He said, maybe if you do this story, all the adults around this kid will see the story, and they'll tell the kids to treat that kid differently. So this 14-year-old A student, he wasn't calling me for him. He was calling me for an 8-year-old. And I, grown man, and I'm hiding my face. How can you not? How can you not show your face then? How can you not? So from that day forward, it's been a mission to not only talk about vitiligo, but find my positivity in vitiligo. Because it's more, it's more than just this disease. It's cosmetic, you know? It does, it's, not gonna, it's not gonna kill me. It's just gonna make me look a, a very different than everybody else. But in this day and age, difference is magic. Difference is what makes you stand out from the crowd. Now, I want to talk a little bit about why it's important to remain positive. Because positive energy grows. Whatever energy you put out grows. And I've learned that if you show people what you want, you'll get it back. When I was showing fear, when I was showing anger, fear and anger is what I got back. But honestly, when I first got vitiligo and I looked in the mirror, I was staring in the mirror fearful fearful when I first saw it on me, fear, because I thought I was going to lose my job. I thought I was going to lose everything. And I'm like, anger, why is this happening to me? I'm looking at every spot comes up I'm like, oh, there's another spot. Oh, man, I'm going to lose my job. I went from one city to another city and it gets worse and I'm just going to lose my job. Fear, anger, fear, anger. But the truth is, is once I told my story, all of a sudden, everybody around the world knew who I was. The thing that I thought was going to bring me down 
made me the most popular reporter in the city that I was in and cities that I went to around the world. The thing that I thought was gonna be the end of my career ended up being the thing that propped my career up to that next level. I never thought it would happen, but that's exactly what happened. So the fight for positivity is what I'll end with. And it goes back to another Hollywood celebrities, and I've had various reactions from not shaking my hand to giving me a hug. I walked in to interview George Clooney, and he stood up and said, I've been waiting for you. And I'm like, me? <laughs> really? You're George Clooney? He goes, yeah. He says, I've been watching what you're doing. And keep doing what you're doing. Keep talking about that. And keep showing your face. And I'm like, really? Why? He goes, I have a friend who has vitiligo, and he's an actor, and he hides it from everybody. As a matter of fact, he's trying to make sure his, he's, he's Caucasian and he wants to bleach his skin out so people won't even notice that he has it. And so, and so uh, George Clooney, when I walked in to talk to him, knew me because I have vitiligo. Can I get a what, what on that? <laughs> it's amazing, it's amazing what's happened, but Will Smith, it's a story I'll end with, Will Smith, um, it's a story, I call it willpower. Because I've interviewed him for many, many years, and he is always positive, always. So I'm walking in to interview him for a movie that I thought was crap, called Wild Wild West. It was, I mean, if you saw it, you know what I'm talking about. And so I walk in, and he's just as happy as ever. He's like, hey, good to see you again. I'm like, hey, good to see you. And I'm thinking sometimes when you walk in to interview him, because they have to do the interviews, they're contractually, uh, contractually obligated to do the interviews. So I'm, I'm saying to him, he, he, I thought he was going to be a little, you know, not glum, not unhappy, but just stayed, you know? But no, he's happy. Like, hey, what's going on? Good to see you. I'm like, wow. So my first question right off the box, right off the box, they say roll. I say, Will, how are you always so positive? No matter where I see you, no matter what you're doing, you have a positive energy about you. And he said, positivity is something worth fighting for. I'm like, fighting for positivity? What does that even mean? He goes, he goes positive energy grows in positive ways. And when I'm in a creative space, I need positive energy, so I fight for it. And I was still a little confused. I said, what do, you, what do you mean by that? You have to fight for it. He goes, if somebody comes in the room and they're negative and they're just dragging and they don't want to be happy, and no, the first thing I do is I try to change the mood. I'll crack a joke. I'll crack a joke with that person. I'll try to make them laugh. I'll try to change the mood. If, if that doesn't work, I go to number two. What's number two? I said, well, if I can't change that person's mood, and believe me, I will try. And if I have power in that room, I ask that person to leave. And I go, how can you not have power in the room? You're Will Smith. He goes, no, no, no. He said, there are people who own things that I work for. And if they come in the room with negativity, I can't ask them to leave. And, I, and he said, then there's the third thing. And I said, well, what's three? If you can't ask the big wig from the studio to leave, what do you do? He goes, I leave. I go, what? He goes, I just leave the room. He said, positivity is something I have to have in creative space just to make it work, because positivity grows. If I can't change the mood, if I can't make the person leave, I will leave the room and come back later when the negativity has cleared. And from that interview to this day, that's how I roll. Because positivity is something that is absolutely contagious. Positivity is the fuel that grows things that grows Apple's and Google's and, and uh, television presenter's career. And positivity is the same little kid that I was when I used to sing next to my mom at the grocery store. And I had to fight not to lose him. So that's the charge that I leave with you all today. Positivity, remember who you are Remember that positive strength that you possess. And don't let this vitiligo or anything else take it away. Because when that happens, when you allow that to happen, it's really you allowing you to change. Because you're the person who's responsible for the creation 
that is you. And it all starts in here. It all starts inside about how you feel about yourself. And honestly, not only am I 6'2", 190 pounds and devastatingly handsome, I have this thing that makes me unique beyond any other reporter in the world. It just does. I was talking to a kid, and I, I love this kid because it's the way that he thinks. Is that my, my daughter? I have a 10 year old. This is a few years ago. She's about five. We're having a birthday party in the backyard. One of the little kids walks up to me. He runs straight up to me. He looks at me and goes, You look like a cow. And I'm like, You're funny. He goes, You look like a cow. And I go, and everybody in the room stops and like looks. It's like one of these. <laughs> like, what's going to happen? That kid just called Lee a cow. Every eye is like staring right at me. And so I smile at him and I say, you're right. I do kind of look like a cow. One of those that has brown and white on him. He goes, yeah, with the brown and the white. And I go, horses have that too. He goes, yeah, like horses too. And he starts running around like a horse. I'm like, yeah, it looked like a horse too. He's like, yeah, man, do you run fast? I go, I'm super fast. He goes, no, I'm super fast. And he takes off running and runs back. He goes, see that? And I go, man, you're super fast. He goes, thanks. When do we get birthday cake? And I go, in a few minutes, we'll cut the cake. He goes, cool, cool, cool. And he goes away. And it was over just like that. Just like that. That, those moments when you have that extra second to think, maybe that kid didn't mean anything negative. Maybe that person is just looking at me because they don't understand. Maybe the way I spin this situation is the way that it will be. And that's how you live in positivity with vidligo. All right, I think that's my time. It's right straight up 11 o'clock. I said I was going to leave some opportunity for questions. If you guys have any kind of questions, can I do like maybe 10 or 15 minutes of questions? And you can ask me a question about anything. Uh, makeup, not makeup, whatever question you have. So if anybody has a question, just, just raise your hand and, and, uh, and I'll let it go. Bernard? Yeah, go ahead, man. A lot of people, particularly abroad, think vitiligo is contagious. I think it's much more useful to describe the disorder because disease is associated with transmissibility. You use both terms. I, I would prefer disorder. And I, I, yeah. You know, we had a big talk about this in my group in, uh, in Detroit. Uh, by the way, my group's been going 10 years strong. We have a good following, 30, 50 people every meeting, depending on the weather, but great group. And we had a big debate about this because uh, Dr. John Harris in uh, Boston, who's doing some cutting edge things with vitiligo, he calls it a, called it a disease. Now here's my thought. People say disorder, people say disease. It doesn't matter what you call it. Just get funding. Just get funding. So if you as a patient feel comfortable calling it disease and uncomfortable, uh, calling it disorder and uncomfortable calling it disease, call it a disorder. But just know that in the United States, to get funding, disorders don't get funding. Diseases get funding. And that's how they get cured is with funding. So if my doctor needs to call it a disease, call it a disease all day, Monday through Friday and Saturday and Sunday. But just get funding and figure this bad boy out and cure it, not for me, for maybe the next generation. So the debate is, it's about how you feel about the disease. I feel like I want a cure. So call it a disease if that gets you funding and gets you closer to a cure. So that's my thought on it. I understand that you get into the semantics of what you call something and what you don't call something. But I don't know how you can get funding for a disorder. Maybe you can in this country, but in our country, they don't even want to cover it with insurance. So if you call it a disorder, you're not even going to get it paid for. You call it a disease and you fight with your insurance company, maybe you get some funding. So that's my thought process. I try to remove emotion from it. Call it what you need to call it to get me cured. That's what I do. Uh, I had one more question. Was it you or there was someone? So, yeah, it was there and then here. Let me give, give him the microphone so you can go ahead. Just say your name and then your question, sir. I'm Gary. Um, I'm just wondering, do you still wear makeup on screen now or 
you know, you, you do. You do wear makeup on screen. Yeah. Yeah, um, the, the makeup, that's, that's a question I, I, I was hoping to get a lot so I could explain it. Yeah, I do wear makeup on television. And the reason, the reason I still wear makeup on television, I can't get close to the speaker, the reason I still wear makeup on television is um, I wear makeup on TV because most of the time, the people like that crazy guy that left me that four minute long message about how, you know, and I get more, believe me. Um, there are some people who can't listen to me with, with, uh, without my makeup on. They're staring at my nose, they're staring at my ear, they're not listening to anything I'm saying because they're too busy looking around my face for the magical party that's happening. Um, and because of that, they're not listening to what I'm saying. And my job is not about me. I mean, a lot of presenters might tell you differently, <laughs> but as a journalist, it's really about what I'm talking about. And the other part of it is, is that when I get at one of those celebrity interviews, I have between three and five minutes, that's it. And, it. and this has happened to me before. I walked in the room to interview Dustin Hoffman. And Dustin Hoffman, he looks at my hands and he looks at my face. He, he looks at my hands, doesn't even, he goes, hey, you got burned, didn't you? I got, I got a burn too, let me show you. And he starts rolling up his sleeves on both arms. He goes, look, my arms have been burnt and they're scarring. You can't tell on Dustin Hoffman at all, but apparently he, he got burned uh, in his, as an adult all the way up to his elbows and his, his skin looks different, he's, it's scarred, but you cannot tell unless, you're, unless he shows you. And so he's like showing me his arms. I'm like, wow, that's crazy. I go, this isn't a burn, it's vitiligo. He goes, no way, what is that? I, was thinking, I said, Michael Jackson. He goes, oh yeah, Michael really had that. And I'm talking to Dustin Hoffman. I had four minutes to talk to him. Three minutes, we're talking about his burn and my vitiligo. And <laughs> we're just talking. And I'm like, oh man, I only have a minute left, Dustin. He goes, wait a minute, give this guy more time. Give him three more minutes, because I talked about my stuff and our stuff. But uh, that's why. Because when I walk in the room without makeup, half of the conversation is gonna be about me and I don't have time for that. I'm really there to talk about what I need to talk about. So as a journalist, just to stay focused, it's just better to wear the makeup on the face. And then the people who see my hands know. But now, and we're talking about, I came up with this 10 years ago, maybe 15, I don't know. But, uh, but now there's so many more people and there's so much more understanding with Winnie Harlow and everybody here that goes living out loud without their makeup on and people walking around that people are starting to get used to it. And once they get used to it, maybe one day I will be able to not wear the makeup and sit down and do an interview and just have a conversation without somebody going, so what's up with your face? I had an actor say that, Seth Green, what's up with your face? And I'm like, just devastatingly handsome because my makeup was coming off on my neck. He goes, I'm just devastatingly handsome. What's up with you? And he's like, get out of here. You know what I mean. And he, he, goes, uh, he goes, do you have, do you have the vitiligo? And I go, you know what it is. He's like, yeah, I actually knew Michael Jackson. I'm like, get out of here. You knew Michael Jackson. What? And then I go, I can't talk about this right now, Seth, because I only have about four more minutes. So I'd love to talk to you about that. But I have to talk about this other stuff. Uh, yeah, you had the next question. My name is Anna. I have a vitiligo since I was six years old. Um, in my case, um, I really needed attention because I'm coming from this functional family and actually people gave me attention, so vitiligo worked positively for me. Right. Only sometimes someone called me, you know, uh, weird, you know, but I didn't take it. I actually, I was saying that I have uh, um, uni I'm United Colors of Benetton mm -hmm. and friends call me, oh, Anya with Benetton uh, yeah. and someone said, oh, Anya is coming, which Anya? You know, Anya with Benetton <laughs> and someone said, I know Anya, I don't know Benetton. <laughs> it, you know, so I'm, I met so many, you know, um, jokes. I'm, uh, I'm also a public person in Polish community in UK. I run radio program, weekly radio program. I'm counselor in training and I wonder how, if you can give suggestion um, I'm quite pale, so you don't see, I have vitiligo on over my, 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 my body, but you don't see it really it's on, on, on me. Yeah. So I wonder how, how can I help people? What would be your suggestion? What, you know, in a public space I could do it to raise awareness in my community? Well, the, the main thing I think is being part of an organization like this. Vidligo Society of London has been around for a very long time and they're really here to help people with vidligo, much like uh, what I do in the States. And when you get connected, when I started the group in the United States, I had no idea of the need. And really people just want to, 
when it comes to something like this, this emotional warfare that you go through when you have vitiligo, it's really about knowing that you're not alone. And so as you connect with these groups and start uh, conversations, that especially as a communicator, you could, you could facilitate a conversation in a group setting in a, in a way that's not only engaging but entertaining. And if you were able to do that, you'd be invaluable to a group like this because that's what makes my group is because I make sure one thing, I hate, I hate uh, pity parties and I hate boo-hoo sessions. Now, we speak with a lot of heart, but we have problems and solutions. So that's what I say is bring to the table in a big group, a small group, I'll open up the communication online, on the radio, whatever platform you have, so that especially on World Vitiligo Day or Open Day or the Vitiligo Society's events, bring people together and help them to understand. Because like I said, I really believe that understanding is the difference. And as a communicator, you're able to not only communicate, but educate at the same time. But as you connect with this group, there's a group in Paris that does the same thing. And there's, a group, there's groups around the world in Italy that do the same thing. And I didn't know that either until I told my story. And you may be surprised. Now, there are places, people in India, all over the world, people have vitiligo. They just don't talk about it. So you said you're from Poland. Is that you, you would be surprised if you opened up to tell them. And uh, there are people in my group as well who ha are light-skinned, and they, they, you can't necessarily tell that they have vitiligo. One of the ladies in my group actually bleached her skin, so she was one unified pale. And she just looks normal, but I know that she has vitiligo. And she talks about that. And one of her talks is, what is important for her with vitiligo? Because your, your journey is unique. I mean, you can't just walk around with a t-shirt in the sun. You'll burn super fast, like I do. And so without any pigment, even though people can't tell, you still have to protect yourself from the sun. You know that, but nobody else knows unless you explain that. And that can be part of what you talk about as you go, you know? So everybody has a unique journey. And how you handle it, it is truly unique to you. And there's nothing wrong with any of it. I do say, take your time, gather your strength, hide at home if you need to. There's nothing wrong with that. But the other side of it is, is don't lock yourself away. Come back outside. Engage in places where, it's, where you can engage, in places like this. My support group was started because I wanted kids to be safe. We have a movie day where I get a movie theater and we watch whatever movie everybody picks and the kids come and everybody's there and nobody stares at them because everybody there has vitiligo. We get three or 400 people in a theater. We all watch a movie, crack some jokes, have some popcorn, and nobody says, look at that kid because every kid in the, st in the thing has vitiligo. Those are the kind of things that you can start that will change things. Uh, the other, we have a picnic uh, uh, in the summer and again, because during the summer, we all have to be careful. We can't go outside. And as soon as we do, look at that guy. Look, he's a leopard. He's a cow. He's a cow. Whatever. You get all these talks. So at our picnic, it's a secluded campground. There's a band shell that covers the area with a cooked place that's under the band shell. And so my picnic is specifically for people with vitiligo. You can go out in the sun or you can stay under the band shell. We have a barbecue. We have music. Nobody's going to point at you. Nobody's going to say anything. And these places that we create, I mean we, I mean the vitiligo leadership. And when I say leadership, I really mean adults. I'm talking about adults. Because adults are going to do what they're going to do. But this is really about the next generation, about kids that have this and helping them get past it. You create those spaces of strength for kids so that they can gather their strength at this place with you and then go out into the world and face whatever they have to face, and then come back with the next meeting and the next event and gather their strength again and then go back out in the world and live with vitiligo. That's why we're here. I mean, you wanna make money, you wanna do well, all those things, but we're really here to help each other. And understand that. There's nothing in this world that happens by yourself. A lot of times people think that you're a solo entity, that you're doing everything by yourself. You didn't, you're not. If you, if you just look at your clothing, I'm sh pretty sure nobody made their whole outfit and wore it here. Somebody else made it so that you could wear the clothes you're wearing. You open up your refrigerator, it's the UN in there. It was grown all over the world, especially in the United States. You look in there, you didn't grow any of that, you didn't harvest it, you just bought it. Somebody else made the food that you eat, somebody else made the clothes that are on your back, somebody else made the car that you drive. Every part of what you do, somebody else was responsible for. 
We are here to actually help each other, subtract money from it, and that's why we're here, especially the adults. We're here to help the kids get through this, to help them understand that you can have strength and honor and power. Looking like this, you can actually be happy. Looking like this, you can date attractive people. Looking like this, you can interview Halle Berry three or four times. <laughs> Looking like this. You can walk in to interview Charlize Theron, and she starts smiling and says, I read your book. What? And you're hot. That's what I said back to her. Thank you. You can have a fantastic life. This is just something you got to deal with, just like anything else. Anybody else had a question? One more question, and I think that's going to be my time. Yep, one more question there. Hi, I just want to ask what age you were when you started getting vitiligo. Uh, she asked what age I was. Uh, so I was, I was 25. I remember the day, the exact, I mean, we all remember the first spot, the day of the first spot. I don't know, I do. I, was, uh, I went to the barber to get my hair cut, like I did yesterday here. I got, got my hair cut yesterday. You can see it on Instagram. It's really, anyway, I think I look nice. Um, I went to the barber to get a haircut, and I got a fade. I used to have hair on top many years ago when I was younger. It was nice. Uh, and uh, I got a fade where it's tight around the sides, right? And so he gave me a cut real small, and there was a spot on the back of my head. So they give you the mirror. You know how barbers are. They do their thing, and they brush everything off, and they flip you the mirror like, here, I'm fantastic. I just did that for you. So I get the mirror and I look and I look in the back and I go, hey man, you nicked me in the back. I thought he had nicked my head, you know, like cut me or something. I just didn't feel it. And I'm looking, I go, you nicked me. He goes, no, I don't nick people. I'm a professional. I'm like, no, you nicked me. It's right there. He goes, no, that's your head. I go, it's your head. And then I look a little closer. I go, no, you're right. It is. It's my head. And I got a spot. So I did what every grown man would do when something happens. You get a spot and you don't understand it. I did what any grown man would do. I went straight home, and I called my mom. <laughs> I said, Mom, I got a spot on the back of my head. What do I, I, don't, I don't know what to do with it. She goes, what's it look like? And I, I talked it out with my mom. She said it was a stress mark and that it would go away. My mom was actually right. The spot went away, but then two more came up on the other side, and then one came up on my hand, and uh, Mom said, go to the doctor the second time I called. So. That was 25, and then uh, probably around 34, I want to say 34, 35, is when it started to, it got on the corners of my mouth, it got on my nose, it started taking over my eyes and my face, and then my scalp, and it's just everywhere, a torso, legs, feet, gone, just started gone. At one point, I was completely void of pigment. I think when I met, uh, I met Simon, one of the trustees of the Vitiligo Society. I don't know if he met me when I had no pigment, but I met him in Jordan when I was doing the Dead Sea treatment with Dr. Schellreuter. Some of you guys may have heard of it. Um, but I met him over there when I was completely pigmentless. And there's some videos online you can see the pigmentless. But uh, I've had it for many, many years. And it took me probably, I want to say, uh, 10 years, 15 years to really get comfortably past it. Past it. But, uh, but now, I, hopefully, I have a roadmap for people to get there quicker, you know? That's why we're here, is to leave the breadcrumbs for others, others to follow. So hopefully, that's what I've done here today. Once again, I want to thank you guys for listening. Thank the Vitiligo Society. Thank everybody, Natalie, Simon, everybody that's here. Just, I appreciate you having me come. And thank you guys for listening. And at the very least, know that you can live, uh, live in positivity. Live a fantastic life, no matter what you look like. Thank you guys for the time. I appreciate it.